There it is. Good morning. My name is Claire. I serve on staff here at the church, and I'm going to be reading today's text starting in Acts chapter 4, verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your words with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. We, this week we, in a sense, I didn't know if this was the correct word, but it's, it's the word I'm going to use. We celebrated uh, the anniversary, 20th anniversary of the attacks that happened on September 11, 2001. Terrorists ran planes into various governmental, governmental buildings, the World Trade Center's Pentagon, and they had intended for more to come. And uh, as I was kind of thinking about it this week, I read an article in Newsweek uh, that it, it, it struck me a bit, and I thought it was really fitting um, for our nation. I'm going to read a paragraph to you. It says this. It says, 20 years ago, uh, we witnessed a defining moment in American and world history. The terror attacks on September 11, 2001 changed a generation and shaped our world like few events ever have or ever will. With the passing of time, a new generation forges ahead and creates their own future while we commemorate the victims and struggle with the lessons of our past. The world has now watched as the war which the attack started has come to an ignominious end. And those of us who had lived through that day and saw an unspeakable tragedy united, or, or unite our nation now wonder how in one time, one lifetime, we have drifted so far Apart. And so, in a, in a sense, this article, it, it, it celebrates what happened uh, in a, a really tragic day in the history of our nation where uh, Americans uh, really were united uh, in the midst of difficulty and a shared struggle together. Uh, you, you have stories that we celebrate now of police officers and firefighters who rushed into buildings to rescue people who were otherwise trapped. You have business owners who opened up their stores with uh, food and water, and everyone seemingly jumped in to do anything that they, they could. Uh, yesterday, I was uh, riding in the car with my, my son, and I had him read the transcript of the, the Todd Beamer call. If you don't know, he was one of the guys on flight 93 uh, who uh, got on the phone with a 911 operator and it, it begins in kind of a, a, a shocking way, and there's a progression that you see throughout the call where in the beginning he's calling 911 to report uh, an issue. Their plane had been hijacked. There's a problem that he you know, would hope to have had resolved, but as, as more people are on their cell phones and they realize that they're, what's happened on their plane and it's been hijacked, it's not just an isolated event, but re rather it's a part of a larger plot. You see this shift happen in Todd Beamer's speech from, hey, we're on a plane that's been hijacked to recognizing, wait, this is a part of a larger thing. And then toward the end of the call is the 911 operator. She says these words to him. She says, I'm afraid that your plane may be a part of their plan. So Todd Beamer shifts even further. And he decides that he's not going to take part in the hijacker's plot. And if you know the story, of course, they rushed the hijackers, the plane crashed somewhere safely in a field in Pennsylvania, but it wasn't without cost. It wasn't without the cost of his life and many of the people there, uh, well, all of the people who were on board that plane. And so there was a, a sense in which we celebrate uh, September 11th as uh, a day of heroism, a day where America was united. And yet, as we look back 20 years later, I think that the writer of Newsweek may be correct that our nation now wonders how in one lifetime we've drifted so, par so far apart. Whereas the start of the new millennium looked like it was going to be about we. 
about us united together uh, as a nation, as a people. It seems that 20 years later, the turn of the new millennium has not been about we, but it's really become about me. And in the relative comfort and perceived safety that we have, uh, we've turned inward once again. We become self-absorbed and self-focused and lost sight of the bigger purpose, uh, certainly in the Christian church, of what God has for us. In 2004, uh, Joel Osteen's uh, kind of his signature work, Your Best Life Now, was released. It's since sold over 8 million copies. It's focused on uh, things of like developing a healthy self-esteem, thinking highly of yourself, using the power of positive thoughts to push out negativity, to usher in the great things that are in store for you, grabbing a hold of your best life now. There's a, a calendar and a board game, by the way, if you, in case you forget the, the themes uh, that are there in your life. Um, Amazon has become the largest online retailer in the world, uh, and their motto as a company is to become Earth's most customer-centric company. The, what was we for a brief period of time has really become about us living our best life, having our needs met. And that's even crept over into the church. Many of us, without even realizing it, would choose a church based upon what they provide to me or to my family. The things that they offer. Do I like the songs that they sing? Do I like the, the way that the preacher preaches and the length that he preaches? Do I like what they offer for my, my kids or my students? Do I like the, the ministries that they're pursuing and ultimately involved with? 20 years later, after looking like it was going to be about us, a united nation, people looking beyond themselves and being part of something greater, I'm afraid that we've ultimately become about ourselves once again. So today, what I want to talk to us about is how to truly live well. How to truly live out the abundant life that Jesus Christ died on the cross to purchase for us. And this begins not with uh, becoming overly focused on ourselves, but it actually begins with becoming focused on others. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, Jesus told us that if we want to find true life, if you want to really live you want to know satisfaction for your souls and true abundance jesus said if you want to truly find life you have to first lose yours he says there in matthew matthew 10 he says uh, i want you to take up your cross and i want you to follow me and you know in the, the first century the cross it was a portrait not of triumph but of suffering it was a portrait of death there was no hope in that symbol. There was no sense of, hey, let's rally together around the cross when Jesus uttered those words. And yet, because Jesus, God, the one that we follow, the one who he invited to come after him, because he took up his cross, we don't just celebrate the cross as, or, or think of the cross as a, a symbol of suffering and ultimately of death, but we think about the cross as a symbol of Life And so for us as the people of Jesus Christ who are following after him, who have found new life in him, if we want to know how should we, how do we really live, how do we truly live in this life, we're reminded that it's by taking up our cross and following after Jesus Christ. We're going to see that illustrated today in Acts chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. We're going to begin in verse 23. Uh, but I want to catch some of you uh, up on what's happening in the story uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw that Peter and John had performed a great miracle in the name of Jesus. It wasn't their power, it was his. They didn't claim it for their own. The whole time they claimed, this is what Jesus did. And a man who had been lame for over 40 years, from birth until age 40, whatever, he got up and he walked. And so the apostles that began to proclaim that, hey, this happened in the name of Jesus. And they began to proclaim the gospel there in the temple. The rulers the chief priests, the authorities, they arrest them and they bring them before the assembly. And they question them, in what name are you doing this? And their hope was to intimidate them into silence. Their hope was that they would be afraid and they wouldn't say anything. And yet, the rulers, the chief priests, the authorities, they were absolutely amazed. They were shocked. They were speechless at the confidence demonstrated by Peter and John, who were unlearned and unschooled men, and the response that they gave on that day. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the rulers, they don't know what to do with these men. 
They didn't have enough to say, hey, you've done a crime, to charge them with some crime that they could punish them. They knew that the people all had their back because when a man who's been lame from birth walks again, uh, you tend to look on that favorably, right? But they also couldn't refute them. They were left speechless on this thing. And so they gathered together and they're like, hey, what are we going to do with Peter and John? And they agreed that they were going to warn them not to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus anymore. Now, what this does is it sets up basically a legal basis for which, uh, upon which they could punish them later if they continued this. They warned them, don't speak or teach in the name of Jesus anymore. And Peter and John, they just continued on. They said, well, we're going to let you guys just, just think about this a little bit. You can decide for yourselves whether we should obey you rather than God. But as for us, we can't stop speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus about what we have seen and what we've ultimately heard. So today, we're going to pick up in verse 23. As those men have been released, they've made their reply to the authorities. And I want you to see um, what, what happens here in verse 23. It says this. When they had been released, they went to their own companions, and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Hey, guys, we were there before them, and we, were, we stood there boldly, and we proclaimed in Jesus' name the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they warned us. And the fact that they warned us now means that there's punishment that can follow. They warned us not to preach or to teach anymore in the name of Jesus. And so if you're a new believer in the city and you remember what just happened to Jesus when he ran afoul of the chief priest and the elders, uh, you, you might have felt a little bit of anxiety in your heart. And yet I want you to see their response, the response of both the apostles and these new believers. In verse uh, 24, it says, and when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. Their reflexive action wasn't to run away. It wasn't to cower in fear. It wasn't to say, all right, we're done with that. It wasn't to run to some sort of comfort or escape or, hey, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we're going to die. But instead, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord. And answering the question, how do we truly live well? How do we live out the abundant life of Jesus Christ here in this life? Number one, we acknowledge the Lordship. Jesus Christ. Look what they prayed here. When they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. This, the, the word here for O oh Lord, we don't have a really great way to translate that. So your translation may say sovereign Lord or O oh Lord. Some of yours may say master or just Lord here. It's, it's the Greek word despotes where we get our modern day word for like a despot. Like a, a, it's, a, it's a, a master or a ruler in some sense. What, what we should get here is that these early believers upon hearing the threats now given against the apostles, which would have extended to anyone who would have preached or taught in the name of Jesus, their first reflexive action was to remember the sovereignty of God, to remember the lordship of God, not just over their lives, but of all creation. It is, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. God, you made us and you spoke creation into existence. You are sovereign over every single piece of this. They practice what we uh, often, if you've memorized many verses, you might have memorized Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. So rather than cowering in fear, rather than becoming uh, anxious and, and stressed out, rather than worrying and figuring, hey, how are we going to fix this problem? They immediately turn to God in prayer, and they acknowledge His sovereign rule over their lives. Oh, Lord, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. There is nothing, there is not one thing that is beyond God's sovereign control. There is nothing that escapes God's notice. There's not a circumstance. There's not a detail. There's not a hurt. There's not a conflict. There's nothing in all creation which escapes God's notice. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows what's worrying you in this moment. He knows about your pain. 
He knows what you rejoice in. God knows and sees all, and it's true for you, and then it's true for this broader collective, this church of Jesus Christ, and it's true for every people in every place across the whole world all at the same time. When they experience these threats, which might have made them want to cower in fear, they remember just how big God was. So they acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ in their lives. Let me say this for us who tend to be me-centric, kind of consumer-oriented. We, you know, what is, what, what is this? What's in it for me, right? That's the question we often ask. Listen, when we see ourselves as at the center of the world, we're going to be disappointed a lot. When we view everything through the lens of ourself and how every circumstance, when we view it for how, do, how does it affect me, how does it make me feel, how do I, how's that going to enrich my life, we're going to live lives of despair because we were never made to be the center. We aren't the point. God is. God created it all. The heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them, they were made by God and for God and for his glory. And until we acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ, that he is the center of all this, nothing in life is going to make sense. We're going to think, what are you doing, God? Where are you? Why aren't you fixing it? Why aren't you fixing my financial difficulties? God, why aren't you fixing my marriage? God, why aren't you fixing our culture? But these young believers understood the lordship of Jesus Christ, that they weren't the center, but God is. And they saw a much bigger picture often than we see. When you back away and you understand that you're not the center, but rather God is, and you're just a tiny little part of God's greater story, uh, then you're going to begin to see where maybe you might fit into this. Look in, in the next section here. O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant. He's saying, listen, the Holy Spirit inspired David, who wrote in the Psalms here. This was you speaking through him to tell the world that you had a greater plan. And they quote the Psalms here. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people devised futile things? The kings of earth took their stands, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. God, you're sovereign over everything, everything made by you, for you, and for your glory. You're in control of all things. And now we're reminded that way back during our, the time of our father, David, they would have said, like, he is king. He was the guy who walked with God. He is, he's noteworthy in all of Israel. Even back through David, you were telling us that there was going to be difficulty, that circumstances were going to happen, that the kings were going to rage, like there were going to be difficult moments that were ahead, and ultimately that they would come against the Lord and against his Christ. It's like, oh, I remember the prophecy, and then they see it. They, they recognize that, oh, this was fulfilled in our, our hearing. Verse 27, for in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Remember the prophecy that David told us, like the Holy Spirit inspired David to write this down, that the Gentiles would rage and the people would devise futile things. The kings of earth would take their stand and the rulers would be gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. Remember what happened with Herod? And Pontius Pilate and the Jews and the Gentiles. And then look at how they interpreted that. In verse 28. All those people, the wicked Herod and Pilate and the Jews and Gentiles who crucified Jesus, they were all gathered together, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. God planned far in advance for Jesus to take up his cross and to suffer on behalf of the people. God planned far in advance for Jesus Christ to give his own life that men and women might truly live. He gave his life that we might be saved. 
And God had it all planned in advance. He was sovereign over every piece, over the earth and the heavens and the sea and everything that was in them. And God was working his purposes through Jesus. Listen, we thought Herod was a bad guy. We thought the chief priests were bad people. We thought that Pilate was a bad person. We thought even that the Jews themselves and the Gentiles who put Jesus, we thought, oh man, they're doing terrible things. We've got to stop this. Like, if you would have been there and you would have been a friend of Jesus, you would think, I would have cried out and said, no, 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 don't crucify him. And yet, what we see here, these early believers understood that this was all a part of God's plan. And that on this side of the cross, we realize that was a part of God's good plan. God used the sinful actions of Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the Jews for his purposes, for the redemption of the world. And if you'd have seen the crucifixion, you might have asked the question, why did the Gentiles raid? Why did these kings gather to persecute the Christ? Why, God, would you let this happen? And yet on this side of the cross, we say, God, thank you. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for the salvation and the forgiveness that we found in him. Thank you for your love, which you exhibited there, that even though we were just dead sinners and had nothing to offer you, you offered your son Jesus. And that suffering that we saw as something we ought to want to prevent, we now see as a glory. The cross, which once represented suffering and death, now represents new life for us. And so these Gentiles, who've, or these new believers who have just heard the threat, don't preach or teach in the name of Jesus anymore, or it's going to cost you. I can't help but think that the words of Jesus were echoing through their, their ears. You want to be my disciple? You take up your cross and follow me. And they didn't see suffering as somehow the judgment of God on their lives, or that God didn't love them, or God wasn't going to bless them, or somehow that God was mad at them. But they saw suffering as the normal path of discipleship. This is what it looked like in the life of Jesus. His death resulted in new life. He calls us to take up our cross and follow him. So here in the midst of this suffering, we understand that this is God's purpose for us. So number one, if you want to know how to find true life, you acknowledge the lordship of God in your life, that he is sovereign over everything, every difficulty, every blessing, every good thing that you're going to enjoy in this life. He's given to you as a gift, and every difficulty is ultimately there to be used for his purposes. So we acknowledge the lordship of God. And number two, they surrendered themselves to the purposes of God. In the greatest act of sacrificial suffering the world has ever known, the perfect man, Jesus, gave his life willingly for the imperfect world, the sins of the world. And there on the cross, in the midst of that suffering, where Jesus might even cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was performing the single act of redemption that would set the world free from sin, that billions of people might find new life. So these new believers, they acknowledged the lordship of God, and they surrendered themselves to God's purposes. Can I just tell you that it's difficult to see God's purpose through the fog of our pain? It is difficult to see God's purpose through the fog of our circumstances or our difficulty, through what we're going through. It's really difficult to make it out in the moment. And yet, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, we can look back and know that God is using our suffering too for his glory and for the good of the world. Listen, your life was never supposed to be about you. Your life was never supposed to be about the American dream. Where you get the house and the car and the kids and all the things there. And you fill up your retirement account and you get to retire hopefully a little bit early, but at least by age 65, right? And then you get to travel and you get to go on the vacations and do all the things. That was never what God intended for your life. God intended, intended that you would offer your life as a living sacrifice for his purposes. Just like Jesus did. That through dying to the life that we otherwise would want, that through dying to ourselves, we might find true life in Christ Jesus. We acknowledge the lordship of God, and we surrender ourselves to God's purposes. James 1, 2 tells us to consider it joy, 
when you face trials of various kinds because that's making you more mature, that's making you more complete, that's teaching you what it looks like to live out the abundant life in Christ Jesus. And let me just say, in the life of suffering on behalf of Jesus Christ, in the life of offering yourself to other people, there is no greater joy. Like there's nothing you're ever going to do that's going to top that. There's no achievement, there's no promotion, there's no level of financial stability or security that is ever going to top the satisfaction that you will find in surrendering yourself fully to Jesus Christ and to seeing him work for you. Y'all, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he's already planned in advance. What you're going through today, God knew about it, and he has crafted you and created you, and he's given you of his spirit that you might bring him glory in your circumstance. And what you're going to go through tomorrow, God knows about that, and his hope like for us is that we walk in him and that we bring him glory in the midst of those circumstances. Acknowledging the lordship of God, surrendering ourselves to God's purpose. And then I want you to see the, th- the third thing here. I want you to see the rest of this prayer. And now, Lord, take note of their threats. God, they're threatening us. We've seen what they did to Jesus. We know what's in their power to do. So, God, would you take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. You know what they didn't pray here? Oh God, would you comfort us? God, would you fix this? God, would you restrain their hands? God, would you deliver us from these circumstances? God, would you just make our lives smooth and easy and we'll have plenty and we won't have opposition and we won't have any difficulty? God, would you just kind of smooth the waters out where we can ride through life like on a sailboat and lots of sun and everything's great? God, would you take note of their threats? And would you provide the provision of confidence that we wouldn't shrink back and live something far below what you intended for our lives? But God, would you help us to live this out? Would you help us to live and speak and honor you with confidence in every single moment? May we never shrink back, no matter the cost. May we live out what Jesus called us to when he said, if you're going to come after me, you deny yourself and you take up your cross and you follow me. Church, if Jesus suffered and died as our example, Why should we think that our lives are going to be any different? Why should we buy the foolish lie propagated in many churches that what God really wants for us is that we'll be healthy and wealthy and prosperous in all that we do? When I read the scriptures, I see men and women who suffered, and yet men and women who truly lived a life that wasn't about them, but a life lived for a greater calling, a greater purpose see these men they acknowledged the lordship of jesus christ they surrendered themselves to god's purpose and then they sought courage instead of comfort you want to know jesus christ pray for confidence instead of comfort pray for courage instead of ease go on mission with jesus christ follow after him And don't go to work tomorrow and live for a paycheck to buy more stuff. But go to work tomorrow with a prayer on your lips. God, give me courage for these people that through me somehow offering myself to them, through the obedience that you're going to produce in me through the power of your Holy Spirit. Oh, God, help me not to waste another day making a paycheck. But God, may I live as your witness in this place. Give me confidence. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place, the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the gospel went forth. And lives were transformed. And the world was forever shaped by people that wouldn't settle for comfort. But instead they prayed for confidence. I wonder how our community would be different if we wouldn't live our lives in pursuit of comfort 
or pleasure or the empty American dream, but instead would live our lives in full pursuit of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord and following after him. I don't know that God's going to call any of us to be martyred for our faith. I don't know that God would call any of us to die on behalf of the gospel. But we can certainly see that God has called us to live for it. And the temptation is to get distracted by all the stuff. And to waste our lives. To never truly live. Jesus said about all the things of this world that can often distract us and get us focused on things that we shouldn't. He said, hey, let, let's, and th there are good things that we should pursue. I mean, you should pursue like kids that live healthy lives that go on to be successful in life, right? We want that. We want our kids to be able to provide for themselves. Or we want to have a good marriage. We do want to be able to eat in retirement. There's lots of good things out there, but they all pale in comparison to the best thing which is following after Jesus and living out, walking out the life that he's prepared for us. So Jesus said to us, listen, seek first the kingdom of God and all that other stuff. The sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and sea and everything in them, he's going to take care of all of that. If we want to find true life, we lose ours. We submit ourselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ. We surrender ourselves to his purpose, and we dare to pray for courage rather than comfort. I want to ask you a few questions today. Do we find true life by losing ours? Is God truly the Lord of your life? Man, do you see that God has taken you and directed you, and he's using you for his purposes? Or if you're really honest, are you trying to use God for yours? God, bless me, protect me, enrich me, prosper me. Because if that's the case, the lordship equation is upside down. Is God truly Lord of your life? Have you surrendered yourself to his purposes? What dictates your pursuits in this life and your priorities, the way that you spend your time and your money and your energy? Is it God directing your life in every moment and you see him leading you and guiding you and you've surrendered to him to be used however and wherever he would wish? Or is God beholden to your priorities and pursuits? And should the day leave you with enough extra time, you pursue Christ. Should you have plenty of margin, you'll, you'll come and gather with the body of Jesus. Should you have plenty of extra money, then maybe you'll give to the poor. Or do you find that you've surrendered your life to Jesus? And seeking first the kingdom of God has overtaken your life. And yes, you could do other things and enjoy other things in life, but your primary and your foremost pursuit is that of Jesus. Are you seeking courage to build God's kingdom or comfort as you seek to build yours? When you think about your hopes and your dreams, are you weeping over the souls of your lost friends and co-workers and family members? Are you delighting in the empty things of this world? If we want to truly live We have to live a life that's not centered on us, but rather is centered on Christ. We surrender ourselves to his lordship, to his purposes. We pray for confidence and not comfort that we might live out the life that Jesus Christ has taught us to live. Would you bow with me? God, you are the sovereign of the world. And in your infinite wisdom, which is far beyond ours, God, you have allowed the suffering of your son, Jesus Christ, to be, be the thing which brought about the salvation of the world. God, you've called us who have been saved by Jesus Christ, who have been redeemed by the blood that he shed on the cross, 
God, you have given us that ministry of redemption. That ministry of reconciliation whereby we go and we plead with our brothers and sisters. To be reconciled to God. Oh Lord, may you give us confidence as your disciples. Lord, may you help us to see through the fog of this life and the illusion of the mirage of the American dream. And Lord, may you help us to see where true life lies. That's in knowing and in serving you. Oh God, would you call us to give up everything we have to lose our lives that we might truly find it. God, would you lead our hearts to repentance? May we weep over the empty things that we've chased. May we weep over the empty lives that we've led. God, may we repent of that and turn and find true and abundant life in you. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.